Welcome to my course on Jewish intellectual history. It is a pleasure to offer you the rich materials of the Jewish past and to present them, particularly focusing on the issue of Jewish identity in the modern era. This is a course about Jewish intellectual history, but it is not only for Jews. It is for all people who are interested in the history of the problem of faith and particularly its experience in the modern era when challenged by forces like secularism and modernism and the like. What we are going to do in this course is first of all to talk in this first lecture about Jewish history and some preliminaries that I think are critical in presenting my material. And then we will focus on the specific period roughly between the 16th and the 20th centuries that this course will uh, take us to. Let me begin with some general remarks about the study of Jewish history. Jewish history, although interwoven with the history of world civilization, is unique in one particular respect. It is unique in its landlessness. This uncommon aspect of Jewish history begins roughly in 586 before the Common Era or before Christ, BC or BCE, whatever you would like to use with the exile of the Jewish community from Babyl to Babylonia from the land of Israel. In the year 70 CE or AD, it becomes even more uncommon with the destruction of the temple, the second temple this time, by the Romans, and the Jewish community spread throughout the entire area, usually known as the Diaspora. In 136, it becomes even more uncommon with the second and third defeat of the Jews by Rome, the destruction of an independent entity in the land of Israel, and Jews now spread out all over the Middle East and eventually into Europe, North Africa, and elsewhere. This is the most uncommon and fascinating aspect of Jewish history. And the question we might pose as a Jewish historian is the following. Without a common government, without a common language, without a common land, how do Jews actually have a history? What gives me the right as a Jewish historian to teach Jewish history in the context of a history department? Is there really something that the Jews hold in common from the United Monarchy of Israel in the biblical period, let us say, to the contemporary United Jewish communities of the United States of America and North America in the 21st century? Indeed, could the board members of that United Community of America actually understand though their counterparts from the biblical period if they were actually able through a time machine to be put in one room? And it's a very interesting question because without land and over a great deal of time, Jews have moved from country to country, bringing with them their own culture, but at the same time, absorbing from the larger culture a remarkable degree of cultural traits from the outside. What holds in common the Jews of Babylonia or the Jews of the Roman Empire with the Jews of the Arabic world? or the Jews of medieval Christian Europe, or the Jews of Renaissance Italy, or the Jews of 19th century Germany. And certainly, what do Jews have in common, even in our own 21st century, between the Jews living in Israel and the Jews living in America? Indeed, each community aspires to be one community. But indeed, are there not differences in terms of background, in terms of associations, that the myth of the Jewish people may indeed be something that Jews aspire to reach? but do we always have a commonality? Now, I'm not going to answer that question fully. I don't think I can. But I want you to at least raise the issue that this is the issue of living within the land and living outside the land is already a crucial component of the uniqueness of the Jewish experience. With the problem of spatial and temporal discontinuity, although it is real, Jews, however, usually acted as a self-conscious and definable group. In other words, they acted corporately and were acted upon corporately. In the Middle Ages, for example, Jews were more or less a legal corporation, governing themselves by their own divine laws as interpreted by the rabbis and buttressed by governmental authority. Only in the modern period did Jews begin to acquire regular citizenship with no special corporate rights and disabilities. But as you will see, losing that corporate status is a function of the modern era. In the pre-modern world, the nature of Jewish religious affiliation is all-embracing. 
Jews think about their law not only in terms of their own personal lives, but how it affects their profession, their community. The entire calendar of the Jewish year, the entire moment that, they, that, that Jews give birth to the time they die, is recognized through a corporate structure of Jewish law. Religion, therefore, is not compartmentalized as we know it today, but indeed is an all-bracing kind of affiliation. Within the context of Jews moving from place to place, from culture to culture, they take that form of all-embracing religious affiliation with them. In more recent times, of course, and again, this raises the issue of what happens to the Jews in the last four centuries uh, of our, of, of our uh, modern world, the sense of group consciousness and religious affiliation uh, has actually diminished for many Jews. That sense of corporate structure, of seeing themselves as a community, whether they are or not, seems to somehow be attenuated to some extent. And therefore, the problem of the Jew living in the last centuries is the problem of defining what it means to be a Jew. What is the nature of this corporate consciousness? How can I explain it when the situation has, in many respects, as we will see, changed? One more point by way of introduction. To study Jewish history in the context of an academic discipline in a university requires something that may be obvious to you, but I want to repeat it nevertheless. One cannot study Jewish history in isolation from the general currents of the time. The Bible cannot be studied in re without relationship to an ancient Near East. Medieval Jewish thought cannot be studied without consulting Islamic and Christian philosophy. And clearly Zionism, of course, a subject we will reach in this course, uh, cannot be studied without reference to the history of modern nationalism. We take that for granted, but as you will see, for many Jews who have studied their past, they have primarily studied it in the context of an isolated phenomenon. To really understand this particular community and its history is to engage with the larger world and to see the patterns of interaction and uh, intercultural communication that goes on constantly in defining the nature of Jewish identity. And that brings me to another subject by way of our preliminaries. Jewish history has not been studied only for the first time by the modern academic scholar. There is a long study of the Jewish past within Western civilization as a whole, and clearly certain dominant approaches have prevailed, which have had a great impact upon the way Jews have seen themselves and have been seen by others. What I'd like to do is mention three previous approaches that have clearly had left their mark on the study of the Jewish historical past. And as you will see, I'm going to suggest that each one of them has its limitations. And in order to pro provide you with the kind of course that I would like to offer, I'm going to try to overcome these limitations. Let me begin with the first approach, which I want to call the Jewish traditional approach. The Jewish traditional approach is incorporated into the basic assumptions inherent in the Jewish tradition itself. This approach assumes the following, that history is a kind of linear development beginning at the beginning of time and unfolding as a kind of divine drama culminating with the entrance of the Messiah, the Messianic Age, and the denouement, the unfolding of history into a perfect world. Basically, to understand that approach is to begin with the Bible itself and to read about a very key word in the Bible called covenant. We are speaking, what is history for the Bible? It is a history of God in covenant with his holy community, the holy community of Israel. And the unfolding of that relationship is a history of Judaism or of the Jewish past. Events occur not because of economic, social, political factors, but because of the divine will. The will of God is the overall governing principle by which we determine what events happen or why events happen. Moreover, this approach assumes that the Bible is itself a divine document written by God himself or herself and clearly subjected to those principles by which God acts. The causal factor of the, of the experience that human beings have is in defining their relationship with God. 
Are they good? Are they moral? Are they upright? Or are they bad? Are they immoral? Or do they disobey God? And these factors, more than anything else, determine the nature of history. Exile, or the Hebrew word galut, is a condition caused by the Jewish people's breaking of the covenant, which will not be overcome until God allows them to repent and he sends his own Messiah. The notion, therefore, of exile and repentance, of land and landlessness, what we referred to earlier, now takes on a kind of theological import. Clearly, the notion of exile is not simply being physically outside of the land of Israel. It implies also a kind of theological casting out. God is punishing. You have disobeyed, you have broken the covenant, and therefore God is punishing you by forcing you to live in the diaspora in exile, at which point you will ultimately return when you have repented from your sins. This particular view, which is also enshrined in the liturgy of the Jewish prayer book, because of our sins we were exiled from our land. Notice we were in exile from our land because of a political overthrow of the Israelite empire, or because of economic factors or social factors. We were exiled because we sinned. Our morality is the causal principle by which God intervenes in history and transforms history to create this condition of landlessness. This view, up until the modern period, is the dominant view by which Jews have seen themselves, have understood their own condition, and particularly have explained the condition of persecution, hatred, uh, animosity towards them as a reflection of God's putting them, casting them into exile and forcing them to punish for the sins of their ancestors. If there's such a thing as a Jewish traditional approach, there is also a Christian traditional approach and that is the second approach that I want to mention to you. This sees Jewish history only significant as a prehistory of Christianity. In other words, only until 70 A.D. or 70 or 136 A.D. when the final revolt of Rome has been crushed, do Jews have a real political cultural history. Jewish history therefore ends with the rise of the Catholic Church, engendered because of the Jewish people's alleged rejection of Jesus and their crucifixion of him by the Pharisees and by the later rabbis. Now, since the Jewish people have rejected Christ, following this theological idea, the church has become the true Israel in place of the original Israel. And what happens, therefore, to Jews after the rise of Christianity is really insignificant and pales in significance altogether. Why bother? Who cares what happens to the Jewish people? They have rejected Christ, and therefore their history is no longer enshrined in holiness. No longer are they the chosen people. What becomes important now is the history of Catholicism, the history of the church, the history of the unfolding of the Christian ideals of Jesus Christ. Now you would think that this theological view, like the theological view, which I call the traditional Jewish approach, had waned in our more recent centuries. But as the historian Gavin Langmuir, who taught for many years uh, at Berkeley, has argued, or argued at least in the 1960s, in studying a series of secular textbooks on Western civilization. It is quite fascinating to see, so he argued, that Jewish, this view of Jewish history has had a remarkable impact even on secular historical writing. So for example, Jews are mentioned in the biblical period in a Western civilization course. They're mentioned perhaps during the lifetime of Jesus. And then all of a sudden Jewish history has no significance. Maybe there's a money lender running around here or there. Uh, maybe we hear a little bit about the Jews in the modern era, and of course we hear about the Holocaust and the rise of the State of Israel, which in, in itself is very hard to fathom given the fact that the Jews had, had no longer played a role in Western culture. What Langmuir is arguing, and what I'm arguing, is that this particular Christian view, therefore, even in its secular form, has left its mark on the nature of historical writing for secular historians, and particularly for those students of Western civilization of textbooks who clearly had already tuned out the Jewish experience from Western civilization. One more approach I want to mention to you which I think is important to put on the table 
and then to discuss its limitations as well. That is a view of the 19th century. And here I'm speaking with great reverence about my own professional ancestors, those who began for the first time to study Judaism and Jewish civilization from an academic, secular point of view. This group of scholars were known as the scholars of this quote, unquote, science of Judaism. They indeed were academic scholars, but they were also overcoming a world which still had liabilities for Jews, particularly anti-Semitism, which was rising uh, in the 19th century and leaving its mark even upon the academic establishment. I'm thinking here of a man I will introduce later in the course named Heinrich Gretz. Heinrich Gretz. Gretz was clearly an important Jewish historian, wrote 11 uh, volume history of the Jews, and left us with an enormous legacy of doing Jewish history, of writing Jewish history in the modern era. For Gretz, Jewish history is composed of two factors. Number one, it is primarily an intellectual history. It is a history of rabbis or of secular scholars and their ideas. It is not a social history. It is not a political history. Uh, it is not a, an economic history. What interests Gretz primarily was telling the story of Judaism. That is how the legacy, the intellectual legacy of the Jewish people was passed on from generation to generation. His story is therefore riveting in telling a story about the world of ideas, of ideological developments within Judaism. But there is a second dimension to Gretz which is equally interesting. For him, it is getting the record straight. Why have Jews been deprived culturally and some say even morally, it is because of the immorality which was meted out to the Jew by the anti-Semites of the world. From time immemorial, from, for generations, Jews suffered the indignities of persecution and atrocities at the hands of those who hated them, particularly Christian civilization. And therefore, the record of Jewish suffering needs to be told, and the anti-Semite must be faced head on. He is the reason why Jews have been depraved. He is the reason why Jews don't have the cultural and political and social significance that other communities have. Clearly what Gretz was doing, and he certainly represents a wonderful example of other 19th century scholars, his history was clearly apologetic. He attempted to show how Jews were entitled to full citizenship rights and that their culture was up to date and was rational. For him, it was clearly the fact that somehow the record had to be straightened out. The story had to be told so that Jews would no longer be seen as inferior as second-class citizens. And as a result, clearly when he came across something in the Jewish experience which he himself found less than modern, less than up-to-date, less than culturally significant for his own day, he would somehow sweep it under the carpet. He would somehow remove it. He would somehow hide it from view. For example, Gretz, as you will hear later on in this lecture series, did not like Jewish mysticism. He didn't like the Kabbalah. He didn't like Messianism. He didn't like things that seemed to him very irrational, the worst part of religiosity. For him, religion was indeed rational. And therefore, for Gretz, there was a need clearly to define Jewish history in rational terms. And therefore, if you want to get a history of the Kabbalah, the history of Jewish mysticism from Gretz, don't bother. It's not there because he hid what he did not want to present to a modern reading public. These are then the three approaches. The traditional Jewish approach, the traditional Christian approach, and the approach of 19th century scholars like Gretz apologizing for Jewish history and writing Jewish history with apologetic notions. A meaningful approach to Jewish history must try to overcome the biases of all three previous approaches. Divine causality, no much, whatever I believe or you believe, will not offer, at least in the context of this course, an understanding of how individuals, peoples, and institutions behave. Jewish history shares a common methodology with other histories. And I believe the reason I can be in a history department is because I teach history and I happen to teach the history of the Jewish community. Of course, does that mean that I'm totally objective as opposed to these three approaches, whether they be biased in a Jewish way or in a Christian way or 19th century apologetics? 
Every historian, if you don't know it already, uh, comes with his or her own biases. There is no such thing as an objective history, and that is why we have historians always revising other historians and always rethinking the past in the context of the present. We live in this 21st century, even though I may be speaking about the Middle Ages, and therefore there is always a need somehow to come to grips with the fact that we are subjective human beings like every other human being. But at least I can attempt, I can be self-conscious about the fact that I have my own prejudices, and I can strive to be objective and honest in viewing the past. In other words, if I can't be totally objective, I can make the effort to try to recognize where I'm not objective and to somehow limit my prejudices in presenting the past. So therefore, I will abide neither by the Jewish traditional approach nor the traditional Christian approach, which have clearly influenced Jewish history for centuries, and nor will I follow my ancestors, my professional ancestors of the 19th century. Now there is one more element by way of introducing this course on Jewish intellectual history that I would like to present. Our study of Jewish history, as you will see, focuses on the history of Jewish thought in the last four centuries. How can we somehow get our hands on this? How can we somehow understand it in a way that will be meaningful and in this remarkable panorama of thinkers that I want to present to you in our 24 classes, somehow we can find a, a way of linking one to the other and looking at the problematics that they are looking at. I fall back on three categories. They are categories that I did not uh, introduce for the first time. They are really part and parcel of the way Jews have talked about their own faith. In very simple language, they are God, Torah, and Israel. God, Torah, and Israel. I would like to use this rubric as a means of not only talking about Jewish intellectual history, but talking about the issues of Jewish intellectual history in the past centuries. Let me explicate what, now, what I mean. First of all, God. The thinkers we will be considering in this course are concerned about the issue of God. God is a central concern of intellectual history in the modern era. The primary question, of course, they're asking, is there a God? And how do we know that there is a God? Of course, this is the kind of question that any introductory philosophy course in the university would tackle. But of course, it takes on a more personal, a more existential sense in the nature of this faith community. If God is the author of the actions of the Jews, as we saw in the traditional Jewish approach, if God is indeed shaping and, and constructing Jewish faith, so to speak, how do we understand God? What happens when we wake up one day and we say, well, how do we know there's a God? I live in a secular world. What does God mean? Why should I believe in God? Can I be a Jew without God? Isn't there such a thing as a secular Jewish identity? Notice this is a Jewish issue, but it's also a human issue of our own experience. For those of us who have been Christians or Muslims or whatever, but nevertheless have a difficulty with the issue, is there a God and how do I know that there is a God? This issue will confront every one of the thinkers that we will be dealing with in this course. And there is an additional question that really focuses on the particular existential dilemma of the Jewish experience. It is also a universal question, but it has a particular manifestation in the wake of the atrocities committed against Jews, particularly the Nazi Holocaust of the 1940s. How can God exist in the background of human suffering? We might call it Holocaust theology or post-Holocaust theology. We might ask the question of, in the wake of Auschwitz, in the wake of the concentration camp, where was God? And if God wasn't there, how can I believe in any kind of faith? A faith in God or a faith in human beings? A faith in the future of human civilization if indeed uh, this horrible atrocity happened? So our first question then, which will be a focal point of this course, is the question of God. The second question is Torah. What do I mean by Torah? Torah literally means the five books of Moses. But here I mean Torah in a much broader sense. Torah as the embodiment of what Jews do, of Jewish activities. Or to use another Hebrew word, the word mitzvot, or commandments, ritual commandments, moral commandments. What God requires me to do. 
A Jew in the pre-modern era understood this perfectly. It meant following what he called 613 commandments that had been articulated by the rabbis and been put in a form of a code. Jews had to follow these commandments. The question of our own century and the previous centuries is the question of are Jews still required to observe these commandments? Do we still accept the notion of a traditional revelation and the dictates of rabbinic law? Indeed, if we cannot, how can we define, how might one define Jewish identity? In place of Jewish law, in place of these requirements, what does a Jew, Jew, to ex a, a Jew do to express his or her own identity? Speak Hebrew, eat Jewish food, I call that the gastronomic Jew, or I feel Jewish, the cardiac Jew, do I socialize with Jews, do I live in Israel, what do I do? Do I go to church or to go to a synagogue a couple of times a year? I probably wouldn't go to church, I'd go to synagogue first. What do we do to define the nature of Jewish activity? What makes a person Jewish is the question of Torah. In other words, the second question is what, how do we define Jewish practice? To say you want to be Jewish is one thing. To do something that is Jewish becomes a question that Jews in the modern era need to grapple with. The final question is the question of Israel. And here I mean Israel not in the sense of the state, even though that is really part of the question. What I'm talking about is the whole issue which for centuries has troubled Jews but particularly has manifested itself in the last two or three centuries. And that is the question of Jewish particularity. In a universal culture, why should Jews remain distinct and apart from others? Why? Why can't my son marry that nice Catholic girl? Why can't Jews and Christians just get together? Why can't Jews and Muslims get together? Who needs nationalities? Who needs distinctiveness? Who needs separate categories, Jews, Christians, Muslims? Why can't individual Jews intermarry with non-Jews? Why can't we break down the barriers? Doesn't love conquer all? And therefore, in this universal setting of ethics, how can we impose a, spe a specific, particular ethic in defining Jews this way as opposed to the others? That is a very difficult question. That question can be asked in other centuries. It was easier to ask in other centuries, primarily because Jews lived in relatively segregated worlds that imposed upon them by the outside world. The question didn't have to arise in this way. They knew they were Jews because they were defined by the other. The Christian governments or the Muslim governments defined Jews as Jews. You knew who you were. You were Jews. You were the people of the book. In the modern era, where there is an attempt to create a kind of homogenous culture, where everyone is, is, is a Frenchman or an Englishman or a German or, or an American, why create these separate barriers? And here, then, then of course, comes the question, if indeed universality is the ideal, why create in the, 20th, in the 19th and 20th century a Jewish state in the land of Israel? In the world that we live in now, with all of its turmoil and all of its suffering, what is the rationale of a distinct Jewish state of Israel, as opposed to a binational state or something else? Why do the Jews need to go create a separate place defined according to their own Jewish tradition? Is there a rationale for Jewish nationalism, for a Jewish distinctiveness, for a Jewish style of life which will characterize the land of Israel? That, of course, is a question that has political overtones which I will not enter into at this point. But clearly it is part of our third question, the question of Israel, the question of defining Jewish particularity. And perhaps that question encompasses the other two as well because God and the question of Jewish practice is ultimately tied up with the question of how I define my Jewish identity. Why should I be distinct? Why should I be separate? What is the meaning of that separateness in the context of a world which pressures me, which imposes to me the ideal of a universal brotherhood or sisterhood among all human beings? What is moral and ethical? What is meaningful in the context of the Jewish experience? These, then, are the questions that we will pose to all of the thinkers of this course. And some of them may have partial answers, some may have full answers. But all of them will somehow have to direct these questions.
as they wrestle with the existential dilemmas of the modern Jewish experience. Thank you. Lecture 2, Defining Modern Jewish History and Thought. In our last lecture, we tried to present some kind of introduction to the study of Jewish history, and Jewish intellectual history in particular. I want now to focus on the other term which is critical for the study of this course, and that is modern. What do we mean by modern Jewish intellectual history? What do we mean by modern Jewish history in general? What I want to try to do is not to present you a course on Jewish history in the modern era, but to try to focus on some salient points which will help distinguish this era from previous eras. I would suggest that six major developments radically altered the character of Jewish experience in the modern era. Let's see if we can list each one and say a word about uh, each of them. The first, and perhaps the most important, a change in the structure of Jewish communal life. What I mean by that is that in the medieval period, Jews functioned, as we said earlier, corporately. They lived under Jewish law, buttressed by the authority of the monarch or of the prince or of whoever was organizing their lives. In the modern period, that corporate structure seems to disintegrate, to fall apart. With the centralization of the absolute state, all groups that are under the state are dissolved, which potentially threaten the authority of the ruler. In the Middle Ages, it didn't matter to the ruler that the Jews had their own separate corporation, their own separate community. In the period of the nation state, the, the ruler wants all peoples, including the Jews, to have one allegiance, that allegiance being to the state itself. And therefore, it is no longer in the interest of the ruler to preserve the integrity of this separate Jewish community. With the lack of an official recognition of the Jewish community, the problem of Jewish self-definition arises. If the Jews are no longer to be considered a legal community, then what are they? Are they a kind of church, an ecclesia? Are they a synagogue? Are they a religious association? Are they a voluntary association? And what is the rationale for their own group cohesiveness? If they no longer have to abide by the rules of the state, if they can go off and do their own thing, then how do we define this Jewish identity? The breakdown of the Jewish community, of course, was not a monolithic process. It took centuries until this emerged. And it varied according to different regions. In Western Europe, we have one history. In Eastern Europe, we have another. In North Africa, we have still a third. And clearly, different groups within the Jewish population, poor and rich, educated, non-educated, men and women, all, of course, define their issue in different ways. But nevertheless, at least from the 16th century, particularly when the process of Jews entering into the larger community when it is no longer necessary to preserve intact this community, the issue becomes, why be Jewish? What does it mean to be Jewish? Is Judaism defined in the same way it was in the past? So the first change has to do with the structure of communal life. A second development, major demographic changes affecting the Jewish community. In the modern era, beginning as early as 1492, we see the emergence of major migrations, major demographic shifts. In the 16th century, Jews move from the west to the east. In the 17th century, they move north, south, east, and west. In the 19th and 20th century, they move primarily from the east, from Eastern Europe to Western Europe, and eventually to uh, the American shore. Clearly, in this period, we are seeing demographic changes engendered by expulsions, by poverty, by persecution, and even in the case of our more recent history, the threat of mass killing. These demographic shifts have a major impact upon the formation of Jewish culture. 
This is a mobile community, it's an emigrate community, a community that is shifting over time and adjusting to new situations and restructuring Jewish life as these Jews move who are on the move. The Jewish community also experiences in this period a remarkable growth, a natural uh, birth, growth, birth growth. That is, particularly in the 19th century, the Jews grow at a more rapid pace than other communities throughout all of Europe. So that during the period of time when we speak about the Middle Ages, we are speaking about a community of several million. By the 19th and then the 20th century, we are speaking a community which triples or is even four times what it was in an earlier period. In other words, we are seeing remarkable demographic growth. In more recent times, Jews have dwindled in terms of their population and their birth rate. But at least up until the Holocaust, up until the 1939, we are speaking about an amazing uh, growth, uh, an internal growth, simply uh, through birth. And one other aspect of these demographic change, not only migrations, not only natural growth uh, in terms of the birth rate, but also the process of urbanization. Jews feel more comfortable in urban settings. And therefore, what emerges in our period, beginning as early as the 16th century, with the Italian ghetto, which you will hear about very, very shortly, the emergence of Jews in large urban spaces, close associations between Jews and non-Jews, urban communities have their own dynamics, rich and poor, social polarization, cultural polarization, the dynamic of urban life, which is clearly different from that of rural life. This is clearly, therefore, a factor. All of these three demographic factors, namely uh, mobility, natural growth of population and urbanization impact upon the nature of Jewish life and Jewish culture. Development number three, changing economic opportunities emerge for Jews in the modern era, especially associated with the rise of capitalism. Now here I enter a very large subject, which I'm not going to treat at all in detail, but I want to mention it to you at least. Beginning with the great historian Werner Zumbart, who lived at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. An argument appears on the scene about the notion that Jews were the founders of capitalism. Zumbart was not an anti-Semite per se, but clearly he presents us an argument which is quite exaggerated, which is quite strong, which certainly could be utilized by anti-Semites to poke fun, to uh, clearly criticize the Jews. For Zumbart, Capitalism emerged with the Jews, particularly those international uh, merchants, those court Jews and bankers, those engaged in international trade who left their mark upon the emergence of capitalism in the 17th and 18th century during the mercantile period. Is Zumbart's thesis exaggeration or is it truth? The answer is yes and no. That is that clearly in a world that was open economically, when there were more economic opportunities a deprived minority like the Jews took full advantage of this situation and entered the world of the capitalists. Were they the founders of capitalism? Were they responsible for the evils of capitalism? Were the Rothschilds, the great bankers of the world, synonymous with all of world Jewry? The answer, of course, is no. And therefore, without entering into the question of what Jews did or what they did not do, clearly, in an open economic environment for Jews, unlike the Middle Ages, there were now opportunities, there were now avenues that Jews could take that were, had not been available to them before, and thus this too impacted upon their Jewish culture. Factor number four, the rise of modern anti-Semitism. We are speaking now not about anti-Semitism in general, whether it be economic or religious in form. We were speaking about a new version of anti-Semitism that actually emerges as early as the 15th century in Spain. We will hear about this later on as well. But becomes most prevalent in the 19th century and the 20th century. And I'm speaking here about racial anti-Semitism. Even if a Jew chooses to convert, he or she will be hated because of the Jewish blood coursing his or her veins. In other words, the racial factor whether scientific or not, and indeed, as we will see, it was not necessarily scientific at all. The notion that Jews can be defined by race, that Jews are one particular race, 
And because of that race, they must be hated, they must be alienated, they must be put aside, they must even be killed if necessary, is something that emerges in full force in our modern era. Jews are hated when they even choose to convert to Christianity. The culmination, of course, of these trends, which reach their development in the 19th century, but emerge in the 20th century in full force, is, of course, the Holocaust. And clearly, that particular event, that singular event in the history of Western civilization, leaves an enormous impact demographically, socially, culturally, on Jews as on Western civilization as a whole. So the fourth development, then, is the rise of modern anti-Semitism. Along with this development is another development, our fifth development, namely the rise of Jewish nationalism and the rebirth of the State of Israel. Jews had lived from 136 CE, as we said uh, in our first lecture, outside, for the most part, of the land of Israel. There were a continuous group of people who had settled there, and the, the issue was debated among Israeli historians. Were they there all the time? Did they come only certain periods of time? But what is clear, the majority of Jews lived outside the land of Israel. When, in the 19th century, a group of Zionist ideologues came up with the notion of returning to Israel, of recreating the conditions of Jewish life in a national homeland, they responded not only to their own dictates of their own tradition, but they also responded to the calls of nationalism throughout Europe. This clearly is a novum, an innovation, a new development which transforms the face of world Jewry right up until the 21st century. The impact of Zionism, of the State of Israel on Jewish life is a profound one, and we will explore aspects of this in our course. Finally, if we're going to mention Israel, let us mention North American Jewry as well. The emergence of the American Jewish community, beginning as early as the 17th, the 18th, and 19th centuries, and clearly the emergence of a major center of Jewish life by the 19th and 20th century, this is a development which is also very new and very different. North America offered a new promise for Jewish immigrants where a long tradition of anti-Semitism was absent and repudiated. If the United States of America was founded on the notion of tolerance, of separation of church and state, that indeed it was perfect for a group of Jewish immigrants who were fleeing from anti-Semitism and persecution and hatred. And therefore that tradition of anti-Semitism was absent, was clearly criticized, was clearly to be separate from the culture of America uh, as early as uh, the, the, the time when the first Jews arrived. At the same time, American traditions were founded upon the notion of volunteerism. That is, the notion of a traditional community imposing its own laws upon its members was repugnant to the idea of the voluntary associations of American culture. And therefore, there is neither a tradition of anti-Semitism on the one hand, nor a tradition of Jewish communal solidarity on the other. And that, in a nutshell, is the nature of American Jewish life doing your own thing, no tradition of Jewish group cohesiveness, leading to easy assimilation and loss of Jewish identity, and no tradition of anti-Semitism, at least relative to what had been available, had been around in uh, European culture. So therefore, these six developments might help us to define the nature of what I call modern Jewish experience, namely, the change of structure of Jewish communal life, major demographic changes affecting the Jewish community, the changing economic opportunities available to Jews, the rise of modern anti-Semitism, the rise of Jewish nationalism and the creation of the State of Israel, and finally, the emergence of the American Jewish community, its unique status within the 19th and 20th century, uh, and its leadership role within the larger community. Now, if you look at the history of Jewish historical writing, which is a field unto itself, Jewish historiography as we call it, you will find that Jews, Jewish historians have debated over the issue of when modernity begins. And we have a long list of historians, which I will not uh, spend a lot of time on now, but I want to mention a few examples to show you how, by focusing on one factor or another, you come up with a different understanding 
of when modernity begins. Let me mention four historians of great significance for Jewish history whose name will probably appear later on as we go on with our course. The first we've mentioned already and we will definitely mention later on, Heinrich Gretz, the 19th century Jewish historian. For him, the critical factor of the 19th century was enlightenment, was the notion that Jews were becoming modern, modern thinking, modern up to date. And therefore, for him, the first modern Jew was clearly the German Jewish philosopher we will spend a whole uh, lecture on, whose name is Moses Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn was the first modern Jew. Mendelssohn wrote in the German language. Mendelssohn could hang out with enlightened Christian types. And therefore, this ushered in for Gretz a new moment in the history of Jews and the history of Jewish-Christian relations. Clearly, therefore, the enlightened Moses Mendelssohn provided us with a turning point which distinguished the modern period from the pre-modern uh, era when no person like Mendelssohn could have ever existed. Another historian as of equal stature to Gretz, writing at the end of the 19th century, was a man named Simon Dubnoff. Unlike Gretz, who lived in Germany, Dubnoff lived in Eastern Europe. And there he saw the world considerably differently. Rather than focus only on intellectual thoughts, on ideas, on intellectual history, Dubnoff was more interested in social and political history and particularly the notion of a Jewish community in the diaspora, in Galut, moving from center to center, from the land of Israel to Babylonia, to the medieval Islamic world, to the medieval Christian world, and finally into our own modern era. For him, the quintessential Jewish community was the community of Eastern Europe, because in Eastern Europe, Jews had founded a, almost a government, a community within a larger community. Never before, like the 16th and 17th century in Poland, had Jews ever developed so complex and so elaborate a Jewish communal structure. For him, the beginning of modernity is the French Revolution and political emancipation. In other words, while for Gretz, the beginning of modernity is an intellectual development, namely enlightenment, for Dubnov, who was thinking more in social political terms, the beginning of modernity was the breakdown of the political community, and the establishment of emancipation of human suffrage for Jews living within European society. A third approach is the approach of Ben Sion de Noor. Ben Sion de Noor has been called the father of Zionist historiography. As we will see, Zionism leaves its mark not only in the establishment of the State of Israel, but in creating a certain way of looking at the past. De Noor was also, quite interestingly, the chief educational officer of the Israeli government in the 1950s. And therefore, his own historical writing has a great impact upon the way education was structured for Israeli youth in the first years of the Israeli state. For De Noor, the beginning of modernity is the beginning of a consciousness of return to the land of Israel. Jews had been living in the diaspora for centuries, and now all of a sudden, around the year 1700 or so, he had to place it more or less about the same time as the French Revolution or of the Enlightenment of his predecessors. So around 1700, he discovered some rabbi named Judah the Pious, Yehuda Hasid, who made Aliyah. Aliyah is the Hebrew word for going to live in the land of Israel. Aha, this was the beginning of a consciousness of exile an awareness that this Jew could no longer satisfy his Jewish life by living in the diaspora and the need to return to Israel. Charting that return or that consciousness of return is the beginning of a modern Jewish consciousness for Dinur. And therefore, his own Zionist historiography is an attempt to locate, first of all, the origins of Jewish life in the land of Israel, the long diaspora, and finally, those steps by which Jews became aware of the land of Israel and returned to establish their own Jewish national homeland. And therefore, return to the land becomes the beginning of modernity for Ben Sion Dinur. One final example of this historiographical uh, discourses. Um, perhaps we could use uh, the example of Gershon Sholem. 
we will come across his name again as one of the great historians of the 20th century. An historian well known for his contribution to the history of Jewish mystical thought, the Kabbalah. For him, the beginning of modernity did not come about through external factors, but more through internal factors. In this case, a challenge to Jewish authority and rabbinic leadership through a messianic figure of the 17th century, who we will hear about very shortly, called Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi calls himself the Messiah in 1665, creates a following uh, who clearly believe he is the Messiah, even converts to Islam, and when he does so, still leads his followers to believe that he is still the Jewish Messiah. This messianic movement of Shabtai Tzvi, known as Sabbatianism, leaves its mark on Jewish culture by arguing for an authority who competes with the authority of the rabbis. Follow the Messiah even if he converts to Islam, says the followers of uh, Shabtai Tzvi. Don't follow the rabbis any longer. What Sholem calls antinomianism, or a kind of nihilistic behavior on the part of the radical followers of Shabtai Tzvi who leave the Jewish fold, who reject rabbinic authority, who challenge the very foundations of Jewish faith and Jewish life. For him, this is the beginning of a radical secular consciousness which leads to the breakdown, to the disintegration of Jewish life. For him, therefore, the 17th century and the 18th century, the period of this movement called Sabellianism, is a time of great transformation, of great disequilibrium, which ultimately leads to the creation of a modern consciousness. Now again, I'm not going to try to give you what is the right answer here. It is impossible to date modern Jewish history precisely. Modernization, I would argue, is more of a process than a particular event or year. Clearly, the process of this restructuring of Jewish life, the breakdown of the community, seems to be an all-encompassing dimension which should be at the very center of our reflections on modernity. But clearly, as you can see, historians have debated the issue, have focused on one event versus another, and therefore, when we describe modernity, we have to be very careful. Are we talking about Western or Eastern Europe again? Are we talking about North Africa? Are we speaking about men? Are we speaking about women? Recently, feminist historians have provided another understanding of when modernity begins if you look at the Jewish woman as opposed to the Jewish man. So here again, we must complicate matters, as historians usually do, in understanding this issue. But generally, this should give you a taste of the larger uh, uh, historiography on the subject of modernity. Now, I must insist on one more element by way of introducing our topic of modernity. And that is, what do we do with modern Jewish thought? The course deals with the history of Jewish thought in the modern era. We are not speaking here about Jewish social history or Jewish political history, but Jewish thought. How can we understand the beginnings of modernity with respect to Jewish thought? And here I want to offer you a kind of proposal which might be a, a useful mechanism, a useful assumption for the entire course. In the pre-modern world, the Jew defined his faith primarily in terms of his relationship with God. In relative terms, medieval Jews were primarily concerned with living a divine life as revealed by God and rabbinic tradition. We used the word mitzvot in our previous lecture, observing the commandments, the ritual commandments of Judaism, men to obey what God had given them. Clearly, there are other factors that might define Jewish identity in the medieval period, but clearly the factor of what God is demanding of me plays a central role. In the modern world, the judge and jury of the Jews' actions becomes more and more not God, but the non-Jewish world or to use a term which Jews have used, the goy. And this could be a pejorative term, or it could simply be a term meaning the non-Jew. That is, what the non-Jew, or what the majority culture says about who I am and what I am, helps to define who I am. In other words, my own self is tied up to what the other is saying about me. Now, of course, that does not mean that in the medieval period, Jews were not interested in what the non-Jew was saying about them. Nor does it mean that in the modern period, Jews were not interested in God. They were. They were interested in God 
in the medieval and the modern period, they were both interested in what the non-Jewish world would say about Jews. But what I'm arguing here is a relative argument, that because of the enhanced integration of Jews into the larger culture of European society, Jews became more aware and more concerned about their own self-image in relationship to the way others perceived of them. And therefore, in the modern world, with the weakening of the Jewish community, the problem of providing a rationale for being Jewish before a non-Jewish world became more enhanced. How can I define who I am in reference to the way people think I should be, is really the question. And that might be a useful way for us to understand, therefore, something about the nature of, of what we are going to be studying in terms of modern Jewish thought. Now, given, if that is the challenge, if you can accept that point, that ultimately the non-Jewish world becomes an important criterion of defining who Jews are and what Jews do, there seem to be at least three possible avenues by which Jews can, can follow this uh, challenge or accept or grapple with this challenge to come up with an answer about their own identity. Let me throw out these three possibilities and therefore perhaps structure what hopefully will be a course that will follow this. Number one, I want to call the first approach to the challenge the insider approach. That is, in the world that I live in now, I want to maintain my Jewish identity. But given the modern world that I live in, there is a need to alter it from its present anachronistic form by tailoring it to fit better in with the culture of Western civilization. Most of the course that we're going to be dealing with are insiders. That is, the insider is the person who wants to be a Jew, but understands that to live in this new social reality and to win the acceptance of the non-Jewish world, somehow my Judaism has to be reformed, has to be tailored, has to be redefined so that I fit better into the culture at large. In fact, the classic problem of the insider is not simply making Judaism more consonant with the values of Western society, but showing why Judaism is unique why Jews still should retain their identity, how Judaism somehow leads, somehow helps contribute to the larger culture as a whole. And therefore, the insider is forced to rethink the nature, to redefine the nature of his Jewish identity so that it fits better in. It's more acceptable both to himself and to the larger culture as a whole. If there's an insider, there's also an outsider. And here, usually, the outsiders don't receive a full treatment in a course in Jewish intellectual history. But let us consider them, and certainly in our course we will consider one quite seriously, mention a second, and perhaps pay passing reference to a third. The outsider, as opposed to the insider, is one who believes that in this new world, the world of modernity, there is no place for a particularistic Judaism. Judaism needs to be overcome in the name of a higher, more meaningful culture. The Jewish problem is solved by eliminating all particularity in the name of a new post-Jewish or post-Christian culture. Who could I be referring to here? The first example, which we'll hear about very shortly, is the example of Benedict Spinoza. And here is how I want to link Spinoza to a course on modern Jewish thought. For Spinoza, the need to overcome Judaism, to create a culture where all rational human beings can share can create something unique which all human beings can benefit from is his solution to the Jewish problem. We might also mention Karl Marx in this regard. Marx, as you know, came from a uh, family of converted Jews. And Marx indeed addresses the issue of a Jewish problem, the creation of a proletariat consciousness that overcomes the consciousness of being Jewish or Christian or anything else. And we might even enlist in this regard as an outsider Sigmund Freud and his particular complex relationship with his Jewish past and his Jewish present. So the outsider, the insider, or the insider and the outsider, and finally, let us coin a new term uh, or a, a term for the third approach, the rejectionist approach. The rejectionist is one who defiantly refuses any encroachment, any dialogue with Western culture in general. What I'm speaking about is an extreme reassertion of Jewish particularity in the modern era. And here I refer to the most modern era, the 20th century, particularly emerging after the Holocaust, 
here is a re reaction on the part of some Jews that the problem with Jewish Christian interaction has been that Jews were always trying to be part of the larger culture. Let's now defiantly do our own thing. Let's reject the past and that relationship with the past and let's simply do something that's Jewish. Let's demarcate our own Jewishness in a way which is almost imposing a new version of the ghetto experience. It's interesting that I fall on the words ghetto because what I have in mind now in introducing these three categories, namely three responses of modern Jews to dealing with their faith, remember God, Torah, and Israel, the inside or the outside of the rejectionist, is to really see our entire course within the structure of these three responses. But in order to do that, I must begin from where I think modern Jewish experience begins, and that is indeed the subject of our next lecture, the subject of the ghetto and its import for the cultural history of the Jews in Italy in the 16th century.